Hi, my name is Phil. I like talking about politics and in the first of this short series on how we got to where we are with Brexit in the first place. I want to recall the most important events as I have witnessed them throughout this whole process. So Brexit is basically the most self-destructive thing a nation has ever committed itself to. But in terms of how we got here, what I'm going to do is I'm going to start off in this first part by discussing how the referendum came about. Now, everyone paying any attention to the situation at all knows that there is one reason and one reason only for Brexit, to allow the super wealthy to get away without paying the taxes that they should be. To this end, wealthy media barons have used their newspapers to push an anti-European agenda. It's particularly noticeable um, that these newspapers try to keep us in the World War II mentality with Nazi references I've seen throughout my life. Even though most of us in the UK now were not alive during that period, and Germany has been a very peaceful country since, normally ignorant members of the UK understand these references perfectly. That's because they've been fed on a diet of it all their lives. If newspapers even tried using references to some similar event from the early 20th century, it would fly right over their heads. Because they don't actually understand history, what they understand are these references. Now, these are the same media barons who sided with their wealthy friends in oil companies, as I was growing up, by trying to create doubt of anthropogenic climate change. Reading newspapers, you might have been forgiven for thinking that there was some doubt over this, that there was some doubt within the scientific community on climate change. There never was. There hasn't been a single scientific paper ever published, peer-reviewed, that has said that there is any doubt whatsoever. There's been no disagreement on both the causes and the effects. And yet you wouldn't have thought this a little while ago. Now, of course, they can't avoid it. The battle has been lost. Things are self-evident. And I believe if they actually get what they want and we crash out of the EU, the same thing will happen. When we are faced with reality, they will have to lose that battle as well. be interesting to see how they turn that around. They'll probably just do what they did with climate change and ignore the fact that they ever caused doubt in the first place. So these wealthy plutocrats have the media to push their agenda onto the people and then they pay large donations to the only UK political party that will push their agenda in Parliament. But even here, common sense has tended to reign in the face of what would be an obviously suicidal course of action to anyone who understands the situation. Until that is David Cameron. A man of such weak political will that he was convinced that the party would split if an EU referendum was not granted. Possibly buoyed by his success in the two previous referenda, along the lines of the Scottish referendum and proportional representation, both of which he defeated, he also fancied his hat-trick, I suppose. Although, it may not be as straightforward as that, because if Donald Tusk is to be believed, and I don't know whether this is true, but it is certainly plausible, he's alleged that Cameron never actually believed he'd have to offer a referendum in the first place. He promised one in his 2015 manifesto under the belief that he wouldn't win a majority in the general election. I mean, how was he going to win a majority, I suppose? Uh, far from bringing the deficit under control, he'd trebled the national debt in just a few years. He'd overseen a pay freeze in people's wages, chaos in the public sector, crises in hospitals. What sort of muppets were going to vote him into government again? He allegedly believed that he'd end up having to form another coalition with the Liberal Democrats and therefore he'd be in the clear. He'd get to push his policies without having to push the more extreme right wing policies because he'd just say, sorry, we're in coalition. We have to compromise on a few things. Unfortunately, and not for the first time, his political naivety scuppered him. The Liberal Democrats were blamed for not reining in the destructive conservative policies of the previous five years. Possibly a little unfairly, but there you are. They were completely decimated. They lost almost all of their seats in the next general election, back into single figures, in fact, of no use to David Cameron at all. He also forgot that the Conservatives are pretty good at convincing people that they are the fiscally responsible party, even though they always reduce distribution of wealth when they're in part in government. Um, he also had the media on his side including the supposedly neutral BBC, whose head of news just so happened to be a friend of George Osborne, the second most senior Conservative MP at the time. In addition, after the general election, 
Labour elected a new leader, a Eurosceptic leader that had long called for the UK to leave the EU and was never in favour of our inclusion in the first place. So now the referendum had to happen. He knew they had to convince people of the benefits of being an EU member. But did he campaign to educate people of all those benefits? <laughs> oh no, that would be too simple. No, what he did instead was to adopt a tactic of saying, right, I'm going to reform the EU. Now, this was stupid for two reasons. As soon as you say that, you're basically admitting to all the things that the opposition are saying, about, not the opposition in Parliament, the opposition in this argument, about the EU. You're accepting it, which is not at all true, is not what he said, but it's sort of how he seemed. And secondly, of course, now the EU has reformed itself numerous times. That's one of its successes. It has, it has kept modern. It has modernised itself to keep up with the times. And indeed, there were EU members quite vocal about the fact that absolutely it was probably time for some more reforming as well. There were certainly issues brought up by, well, what passed for a debate. And absolutely. But Cameron only had a few months. It was one of the most retarded decisions he'd made in this process. Obviously, it, it could go nowhere. You can't reform it in a few months. You wouldn't even get general agreement about what needed reforming in a few months. So he then comes back and, and the public are then, you know, the Leave campaign are able to say, look, you know, he even he admits there's things wrong with the EU. He can't get it changed. The EU won't change. It's too inflexible. Uh, we need to leave. So we had a Remain campaign which did nothing to emphasise the benefits of being in the EU, which fell largely flat. In fact, it was actually seen as being the more negative campaign. The Leave campaign, on the other hand, were very good at publicity stunts. But what was their convincing plan for Brexit? What was it that they united the people around in terms of the post-EU future? There wasn't one. All those people who say, oh, if only so-and-so were in charge of the negotiations, it would all be fine. Where is their Brexit plan? You show me where anyone has ever published a Brexit plan. Nobody ever has. And this is because the Brexiteers learned over a decade ago, because this has been going on for, for ages, years and years. They realised that it was foolish to try and agree on any post-exit strategy because none of them could ever agree on anything. So instead of saying how we would benefit from Brexit, they instead just ran a deceitful campaign of what they didn't want. If you look at the Leave campaign website, even now, it doesn't have a post-Brexit plan. It has pages and pages of what they are against, but not a single line on what they are for. But of course, this works brilliantly. They would have had no more chance of convincing people of a single Brexit vision than they did of agreeing amongst themselves. So they spun lies about immigration, jobs and laws, all the things you would try and do if you're going to whip up anti-foreign fervour, as is exemplified numerous times in history in various countries. They just played the same old tricks again and again. But they didn't just rely on that. They used modern systems. They used a data mining company called Cambridge Analytica to target members of the public with misleading messages in order to bombard people with a common message from all angles. So it, it was almost like in people's minds they weren't getting this just from one source. A whistleblower working at the company testified to MPs about how the company fooled the electorate in both the UK over Brexit as well as the US in the presidential elections. The way they gathered and used personal data on millions of people was very much illegal as the people who, whose information they took didn't give consent for it. Um, although people do give consent for Facebook to have a limited use of their data, even that is a bit naughty really, um, but it's all legal because you're giving consent. Cambridge Analytical, Analytica stole the data. So there was no way users could have known that the company was mining their information and, and of course didn't give consent for it. But that wasn't the only illegal action that Vote Leave took advantage of. They also broke electoral law in the way it passed large sums of money around to pay for various nefarious services, including that of Cambridge Analytica. In fact, one even had a, a young man who was given a ridiculous amount of money just to pass on to this company and, and not have to put it on the books of the Leave campaign. So there was an awful lot of money being spent, but because they threw it through subsidiaries, they didn't think they had to report it. But that was not true. Now, although they were found guilty, they were only fined because the vote was advisory only. Had it been a binding vote then the consequences would have been far more serious for those involved. Now, just to tell you how pathetic even the fine was, 
for a start, when you're talking about the, the serious wealth the, the backers of this campaign have, um, the amount of the fan, it was something like 60,000, was pathetic. But the other, I mean, the thing that really throws it into contrast is I've seen footballers get bigger fines than that for like wearing the wrong socks or not turning up to training. Um, an absolute nonsense. But ironically, of course, MPs decided to treat the vote as if it were binding. This not only meant that the criminals got away with a small fine, but they completely got away with their criminal acts. Even then, the Leavers didn't believe they would win, however. Um, the career Brexiteers wouldn't even want to win. They'd lose their only source of income. You know, if the Leave campaign ever won, their paymasters would no longer need them. So because they were confident they'd lose, they were already putting into place their post-referendum strategies to call for another and therefore justify their wages. But then the result came in. David Cameron quit and went off to France where he'd heard that they don't really care what you do to pigs over there. And that's how the referendum came into being. And the result panned out. In the second part, I'm going to explain how the election of a new Prime Minister sent Brexit down a cul-de-sac. So I hope you enjoyed the video. If you did, don't forget to click the like button, subscribe for further content, click the bell notification, share with others who might also be interested. And until next time, I'll see you later.